Good morning. Uh, my name is Drew Robertson on this uh, June summer day. Uh, if you are looking for a church home, we would like uh, to, to let you know that an elder will be standing here by the baptismal font uh, at the end of sanctuary to provide additional information. Also, as a reminder, as a ritual friendship, uh, members and visitors, uh, please find the black register uh, at the end of your pew. Please pass it up and down the pew so we can have a, a record of your attendance. We certainly want to welcome our visitors. Uh, as a reminder, please silence in at your cell phones uh, as we continue to worship today. Another mention, uh, if you didn't know that we have a podcast of worship, uh, you can refer to the church bulletin, but compact discs are available through the church, or you can pull that uh, from the website, which is a great way to continue if you're not present one weekend. Um, Additionally, uh, you know, we're, we're in a time of prayer right now as we're, we're looking for a, a minister. Uh, just a reminder about the blue prayer cards that are in your pews. If you've got any prayer requests, uh, please fill those out and uh, we'll collect those up in the offertory plate or you can hand them in. Uh, we certainly want to stay engaged in prayer. Uh, also, as it is, as it is summer, uh, if you will think about Camp Hopewell uh, in uh, St. Andrew Presbytery, it's our camp got a lot of really neat stuff that's it's going on over there as some of you may know I'm all over the board I've got one in college one in high school and one in kindergarten so uh, we are we are uh, veterans of Hopewell but just as a reminder as it's reflected in the bulletin please think about Camp Hopewell uh, in any type of support uh, that you may uh, prayerfully render also we are have a Habitat for Humanity home that is going up it's at 422 North Broadway uh, the work days are July 8th, 15th, and 22nd. Uh, and this is just a, a, an appeal from the liturgy up here. Uh, we're looking for all ages. We're looking for young backs, old backs, medium backs. But if you uh, are so led, uh, we are, we're looking for some folks. We probably need 15 to 20 volunteers, uh, all ages, but certainly are looking for some young, strong backs too. Uh, for all other announcements uh, or for more information, please respond to the church bulletin. And now I'd like to welcome uh, Aubrey Patterson up for a, an exciting uh, announcement that you can also find a flyer in your bulletin. have in your bulletin today an insert if you haven't had a chance to uh, read that at this point uh, please uh, do so at your leisure uh, you'll notice it is signed by the search committee members uh, Richard Hastings, Melissa McDuffie Mike Thomas and myself and uh, any of us would be happy to respond to questions for more information that you might have, want to have about the process. I'm tickled, frankly, that we've been able to move as a committee through the process of uh, obtaining the services of an interim pastor uh, in just about an even month. Uh, when you have to deal with the prescribed procedures, it usually takes quite a while. Uh, I want to commend my fellow members of the committee and other staff support who supported us and people at the Presbytery to let us move along as rapidly as we did and still be sure that we were adhering to the goals and the needs that we were sure we needed to make a priority. We, the, the session in the Presbytery approved last Monday evening at our session meeting entering into a contract with the Reverend Olin McBride. So, some several of you know Olin from his previous times in this presbytery. He's well known and respected throughout the presbytery for his good work in the congregations at Leland Starkville, and we're certainly looking forward to having him here. He, is, he meets the classification of a servant leader, and the members of the committee and others that have had a chance to know him believe that he's a great fit for our congregation. He, he, everywhere he's been, churches have grown during his time of service there. And his wife, Jim, 
uh, her name is Virginia, uh, but, but we've been advised that she goes by Jim, and she is a delightful lady uh, who I think will be a, a wonderful partner with Olin in his ministry here. Our contract for an interim is to let us plan uh, carefully and thoughtfully through the pastor nominating committee process and the search for a permanent minister. And to that end, what we have entered into is a one-year contract that can be extended or shortened as need be for a variety of reasons, the most obvious being in case we find a candidate sooner that we would want to recommend for the permanent pastor, pastor's position. Olin is, after the approval by Presbytery, signed by our clerk of session, and signed by Olin on last Monday evening, the 19th, he immediately gave a 30-day notice to his congregation in McDonough, Georgia, and his first sermon will be preached on uh, July 31st here in our church. He'll be in and about for most of the week before that, getting settled in and moved. He's already found uh, an apartment with the aid of some congregation members. But he'll need a little time to get settled, and he will preach his first sermon here on uh, July 31st. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is to express my personal appreciation to those named members of the search committee. Uh, they worked hard, they were always available, and uh, everybody came to the same conclusions after we debated and thought through and looked into all of the backgrounds of the individuals we considered. So I, th I think, uh, I know I'm indebted to those members of the committee and I believe the congregation is too. Again, if you have any questions after the service, uh, I believe everybody is here this morning, and just look up the member that you want to talk to and ask whatever questions you may have. But we're, we're excited about the timing, we're excited about the individual who will be leading us, and we look forward to working together with him uh, as he goes through this next phase in his active ministry. Thank you.
And now the call to please stand for the call to worship. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you I cry all day long. Good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. Let us worship God. You may be seated. And as found in your bulletin, now the call to confession from Psalms 34:18. And I, we're tying this into our offertory message, so I pray for your listening. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Prayer of confession: Gracious God, in Christ Jesus, have mercy upon us. 
we are not quick to proclaim Christ as our Savior. We have our own desires that demand our devotion. Other people have power over us that we dare not deny. We sometimes confuse Christ's will and our own. At times, it is awkward to confess him the new source of life. With compassion, he suffers, aware of our plight. O oh God, hear our confession, and through Christ, keep us upright. Amen. Friends, believe the good news. God is for us, not against us. still hear me? It's coming through. I'd like to invite the children. There. Can the children, I'd like to invite the children down, please. All right. It's a good looking crew we got this morning. All right. So let me ask you a question. Have you ever dropped something on your toe? All right, so what is this? All right, touch it. Make sure. Tell the people. Is it real? All right, it's real. You want me to drop it on your toe? No, no, we don't want to do that. All right, so what do we know about this if it fell on our toe? It might break bones. It might break bones. Warren, that's a very good observation. It might bleed a lot. And we know a lot about Band-Aids and Neosporin in our house, don't we? All right. So, well, let me ask you this. What do I have in here? All right, so, so take one of those. Everybody, everybody pass those around and take one. Pass the cup around. Get, get him one. So what is that? It's a pebble. All right, so will this hurt if it falls on your toe? No. You don't think so? All right, well, let me ask you this. Everybody, put that in your shoe. Put that in your shoe. All right, now stand up. Ah, wait, do you feel it? What's that? You can't even feel it? All right, you sit down. You're not going to participate anymore. No, I'm joking. All right, so everybody can pretty much feel that. And if you walked around all day, you would kind of begin to not feel so good. You guys can sit down, right? All right, so let's think about, it's the, very, it's the same thing with sin. Let's think about big sins, all right, and let's think about little sins, okay? So are they the same, or are they, what do you, how do you think God looks at sins? Um, those are kind of different. They're kind of different, but we know this is what John tells us in 1 John 5, 17. All wrongdoing is sin. So it doesn't matter if it's a big sin like this rock, or if it's a little sin like the pebble, like telling a fib or telling a lie at school. Has anybody ever done that? Nope. I did when I was younger. Did you? Uh, you? We're not at school. Okay, we're not at school. Well, that's very good. All right, well, listen, I would like you to pray with me right now and we think and reflect about this. Father in heaven, we know that your word says that all wrongdoing is sin. And we want to please you, so we ask that you help us to remember that no sin is small enough to be okay. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so you take that pebble with you and just think about doing the right things. Tell your parents and grandparents to thank me later, okay? If you'll stand up and all the children of God say, may God be with you here. And all the people of God say, may God be with you there. Thank you.
Thanks and praise for that beautiful anthem. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, good morning. Um, for those visiting, I am Emily Jarrett. I am serving as the interim director of Christian education here at First Presbyterian. Um, I'm usually on that side of the chancel, so I am glad to be on this side of the chancel with you this morning. Please join me in prayer. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our first reading is from the Old Testament book of Genesis. Um, we are picking up here with the story of Abraham and Sarah. Um, and we are meeting them at a difficult place where Abraham is struggling to respond faithfully to his wife and to his child. Um, let us listen now for and hear how um, God responds to us even when we are at a loss. Genesis 21, verses 8 through 21. The child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. And she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. 
Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. And for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. And when the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. And then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off about the distance of a bow shot, for she said, Do not let me look on the death of a child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and she wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God came to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is, Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. And then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and she filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. And he lived in the wilderness of Paran, And his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Our second reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 10th chapter, verses 24 through 39. Listen now for a word from God. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Fear rather him who can destroy both soul and body. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? And even the hairs on your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother, mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I don't think that I am alone when I say this is not my favorite passage. The Jesus that I know comes to bring peace, not a sword. We all have these images of Jesus that swirl around us. Wonderful, counselor, prince of peace, lamb of God, all of these calm, peaceful images of Jesus. 
And maybe these images were in the heads of the disciples also. They knew the prophecy from Isaiah. Maybe they were expecting a calm and peaceful journey. And then we have Jesus here declaring to the disciples and to us that he comes with a sword to set family members against one another. I want to ask, has Jesus gone too far here? Do we really need a gospel reading today that seems to say at first glance, families don't matter? Don't we hear that from other places enough today? Well, we meet Jesus and the disciples here just a few chapters after Jesus has called them to be the fishers of men. In a short time, we have gone from what felt like, once they decided to just leave their jobs, what felt like a sort of easy task, to this journey of discipleship that has gotten quite intense. They have been sent out on a mission that involves preaching and teaching, and the disciples have quickly learned what it means to face opposition and struggle. The cozy days of breaking bread with Jesus seem in the distance, when in response to the good news of the gospel that they are sharing on their mission, they're rewarded with persecution. Jesus here is trying to prepare the disciples for their new reality. We are a family that loves musicals. Okay. Two of us love musicals more than the other two love musicals, and I admit I'm often in the latter group. Um, for example, most families have Fourth of July traditions that involve going to the lake or grilling out in the backyard with friends. Ours usually involves watching the musical 1776. You were all invited on Tuesday to watch. But there is one musical that we all can agree on, and that is Lin-Manuel Miranda's new musical, Hamilton. It is probably a good thing that Maggie Jarrett is not here today to hear this sermon. She would be struggling to not jump up and burst out into song. The soundtrack is on repeat in our car and in our house all of the time. And if you haven't heard much about Hamilton, it is a gloriously diverse cast that uses rap and hip-hop, jazz, R&B, ballads, and more to share the life and legacy of Alexander Hamilton with the 21st century. Now, who would have thought a rap about a founding father would be such a hit? But it really is incredible. We learn of his tragic childhood, his gifts with the spoken and written word, his passion for justice and revolution, and his human frailties. We hear how he created our federal financial structures and how he made many enemies over the years with his fearlessness in speaking up for the causes in which he believed. Early on in the play, the song, My Shot, and Hamilton and his fellow revolutionaries are rallying to lead the colonists out from under the oppressive rule of King George. They are trying to get them to stand up for what is just and to wait no longer to work for the cause that they have realized is worth living and dying for, a cause that is beyond themselves, a cause that will change their world as they know it. As Hamilton and his friends become bolder and more resolute in their plans, Hamilton calls them to rise up. It is time to take their shot, to act for that which is most important. In this scripture from Matthew, Jesus, speaking to his closest disciples and to us, tells them to rise up. Jesus encourages them, do not be afraid of what others will say about you. Rise up. You are on the side of my Father who knows the sparrow and the number of hairs on your head. If you fear, fear the one with real power, not the presumed powers of this world. It is time to proclaim a better way, a higher power another kingdom. It is time to rise up. And the disciples are afraid. Jesus is laying it out for them. The task before you will not be easy. The message is not easy to hear, but it is important, so get ready. 
Jesus tells his disciples, What I say to you in the dark, tell everyone in the light. And what you have heard as a whisper, proclaim from the housetops. It is the time to tell the world about God's kingdom. It is time to proclaim the good news. This is their cause. But I need to go back to the line in this passage that makes me cringe. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. We can't ignore this line from Jesus as much as I would like to. So maybe Jesus is saying here that being the prince of peace isn't always peaceful. Maybe Jesus is saying to the disciples and saying to us that peace is not maintaining the status quo. Maybe Jesus is saying, I bring the truth, and the truth is not always peace. Because when we tell the truth, the response is not always hugs and celebrations and invitations to dinner. It's not that we intend argument or antagonism. It's just that peace sometimes is hard to come by when the truth ends up actually being said. Maybe this is what Jesus is trying to get across to the disciples and to us today. If you are afraid to spread the gospel, if you fear resistance to the truth of which I am asking you to speak, well, I have news for you. What I'm asking you to do is hard. Working towards the kingdom of heaven is not an easy or quiet existence that is free from disturbance and discord. Rather, the kingdom of heaven disrupts. The kingdom of heaven can be unsettling. The kingdom of heaven can upend. And if we think about it, take seriously what we read and study in the Gospels, what Jesus stands for, what Jesus taught us was important, and then saying that out loud, it's risky business. Relationships can change. How we spend our time and our money can change. When we rise up for what we believe, nothing remains the same. The disciples' task and our task, your task, my task, this church's task, is to rise up every day and despite our fears, fears of how it might make others feel, fear of how it might change our comfortable day, Fear of how a dinner party might react if we bring up health care. Fear of what someone may say in response. Despite whatever our fears may be, we are called to speak, live, and act the gospel that Jesus teaches. The gospel that brings true peace to those who suffer, to those in need of healing, to those marginalized, to those oppressed, the gospel that brings true peace to you and to me. And this is a choice we are constantly making. It's not something that we have decided once, maybe made note of in a journal or a Bible somewhere. As a church, we rise up each time we choose to be a witness to God's love with a stranger at the Salvation Army on the construction site of a house that is striving to bring affordable housing to our community, with families all over the world who need clean water, at the bedside of someone who is sick, each time we speak up and help someone who does not have a voice in our society. In Hamilton, the lyrics continue, tell your brother he's got to rise up. Tell your sister she's got to rise up. I love this because, thanks be to God, we are not on this journey alone. We have each other to remind us to rise up when we find it difficult. We also have the promise that God, who has faced all of these things before us, now faces them with us. As a church, right now, we are preparing for new leadership in the interim and are looking for long-term leadership, and we have the opportunity to find someone who will rise up with us, 
who will help us explore how we as First Presbyterian are called to rise up in this community. Someone who wants to walk with us despite our fears and our hesitations and will help guide us. For when we rise up, we are invited into something greater than ourselves and we are sent to become what God has called us to be, the community of faith that can transform the world. Amen. Please stand and join me in the hymn of dedication, hymn 272. now affirm together the things we believe using the Apostles' Creed found in our bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communions of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I bring a few concerns and celebrations before you this morning. We continue to hold in prayer the family of Josephine McVeigh. Um, she died this past week. We still um, do not have information on her services, but we will put that out on email as soon as we have that information. Fayette Williams has now moved to the swing bed facility in Pontotoc and continues to do well. 
We are glad to see Kirk here in church with us again today, so we are grateful for the recovery he has made and continue to hold him and Teresa in our prayers as they continue healing. We pray this morning for those who are undergoing cancer treatment, for Claire Herndon, and for Tina Barber, who is the daughter-in-law of Charlie and Emily Barber, and for Julie Seiler and Amy Burrow. Are there other um, prayer concerns for the good of the community? Let us go to God then in prayer. God of creation, God of the ages, God of this very moment, thank you. Thank you for singing birds and for the long days of daylight. Thank you for friends who have sustained us. Thank you for questions and doubts that heighten our attention. Thank you, O oh God, for those people sitting close to us now, each one with a host of cares and concerns. Thank you for our hearts beating together in this one place, this place where we have come seeking your grace, hoping for strength, wanting to be reminded of your love, wanting to witness sparkles of your holy presence. Almighty One, you have given us this land as an inheritance, forming refugees and wanderers into a great nation. Fill our leaders and all who hold authority in this world with kindness and generosity, that all people may live together in hospitality and peace. Compassionate One, hear the cry of those who suffer. We pray today especially for Claire, Julie, Amy, and Tina, for Fayette and Kirk. Let your gracious love touch all who need your grace today, both those known to us and also those known only to you. For ourselves, we ask for a relief from fear and anxiety, no matter what challenges we face. Some of us need help with the care of aging parents. Others need strength in daily decisions about children. Jobs are a challenge, income a worry. For some, there is grief almost too painful to bear. Give us strength, dear Lord, and greater trust in you. For by your hand, we know all will be well. We pray for this congregation that you lead us with joy into our unknown future and that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon this place and its people so that through our faithfulness to you, more of your people will come to know your grace and glory and sustaining love. Most of all, Holy God, grant each of us the gift of grateful hearts, grateful for life, for the promise of faith, and even those we don't quite understand. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God has provided enough for us to share. As we give thanks, let us present our tithes and offerings. Slips 
fades in Trying to fade in to the faces Girls teasing laughter is carrying farther than they know Farther than they know Are the body, why aren't his arms reaching? Why aren't his hands healing? Why aren't his words teaching? If we are the body, why aren't his feet going? Why is his love not showing? Then there is a way. There is a way A traveler is far away from home He sheds his coat And quietly sinks in to the back row And looks on their judgmental Faces are letting him know he's better out on the road. But if we are the body, why aren't his arms reaching? Why aren't his hands healing? Why aren't his words teaching? If we are the body, why aren't his feet going? Why is his love not showing? Then there is a way. For Jesus paid much too high a price For us to pick and choose who should come We are the body of Christ Why aren't his arms reaching? Why aren't his hands healing? Why aren't his words teaching? If we are the body, why aren't his feet going? Why is his love not showing? Then there is a way. Jesus is the way. pray together the prayer of dedication. O oh God, we have been led to acknowledge Christ Jesus as the source of new life. As you have called us to be your people, accept now the offerings we bring you. Use them to spread your message from east to west and from south to north, so that those who come after us may be led to proclaim you God of their lives. Amen.
So now go out into the world and rise up, knowing that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit goes with you this day and every day. Amen. Amen.